welcome to a Clear Mountain interview. And today we're blessed to be joined by Oren uh, J. Sofer, author of Say What You Mean and most recently, Your Heart Was Made for This. Uh, generally, we would read the bio of uh, the guest, but actually today we thought, Oren, we would uh, ask you to introduce yourself and tell us about your um, path uh, in Buddhism briefly and sort of how you came to land here um, and also your path through those two books. And can I also just say we're very grateful to have you join us. Your books have been uh, hugely valuable to us and, and quite meaningful. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a real honor. I'm um, delighted to be here and uh, touched that you reached out and invited me. Um, we were just, just chatting before and you know, Ajahn Kovalo and I have known each other kind of loosely through the community for, I don't know, over a decade probably. Yeah. So quite, quite sweet to reconnect and be here. Um, yeah, and also it's very meaningful for me to know that my, my writing or my work has contributed to you and to uh, the monastic community. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, well, I started practicing Dhamma when I was 19. Um, I had the good fortune of doing a study abroad program in India, in Budgaya, um, living at the Burmese Vihara uh, in my undergraduate studies. And I kind of dove in head first and was very moved by um, the first teachers we had there at the program who happened to be Anagarika Manindraji uh, and Godwin Samararatne, a mindfulness teacher, a Dhamma teacher from Sri Lanka. Uh, so I, I started there and kind of radically changed my life. I was a childhood actor before that, um, and I changed my major at college and uh, started stopped acting, started meditating every day, um, and things just kind of unfolded from there. About five or six years later, when I was living at the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, the Insight Meditation Center founded by Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Kornfield, and Jacqueline Mandel, I was working there and living there um, as a cook, a residential uh, retreat center cook. I discovered Marshall Rosenberg's work with nonviolent communication, uh, which was another kind of like revelation. I felt a, a, another sense of homecoming with that practice, and it provided a very practical bridge to translate what I was cultivating on the cushion in my meditation into my conversations and relationships how to embody the kind of compassion and clarity that we cultivate in meditation um, in communication. And then some years later, I came across Peter Levine's work uh, with a practice known as somatic experiencing for healing trauma, which added yet another lens and toolkit to working with the body, with emotions, with deep-seated patterns in the nervous system that also I found to be very resonant and consistent with Dhamma practice. In fact, many of the principles that Peter Levine was talking about, um, I had heard my teachers talk about in Dhamma, in, in Dhamma practice, both Ajahn Suchito, Michelle McDonald. I think that they, in their own way, sort of drew from their own experiences with different kinds of trauma healing and somatic work and were able to language uh, Dharma teachings and meditation processes in that framework, so it all started to kind of fit together. Um, and yeah, in 2018, I think, I published my first book, Say What You Mean, which is an integration of some of those different streams and really looking at how do we use mindfulness and nonviolent communication to improve our relationships and our conversations. Um, and then my most recent book, Your Heart Was Made for This. Um, there are two ways I talk about what inspired me to write the book. So from the perspective of communication, it provides a much broader training ground for all of the other qualities that are necessary to have important and difficult conversations, things like courage and curiosity and patience and equanimity and renunciation, letting go, all of these skills that we actually need to draw on when we're talking about things that are deeply meaningful and important to us in our lives. And so that's one angle on the book is kind of filling in the rest of the background for having more effective conversations in our lives. Um, the other background and 
sort of initial impetus of the book was the really difficult year we had in 2020 and wanting to contribute to more resilience in, in our communities and really seeing the Buddha's teachings on right effort, and cultivating wholesome qualities, releasing, abandoning unskillful qualities as a kind of roadmap for resilience. And so I started writing about different qualities from my own experience, from my training in Dhamma, both in lay communities and the monastic community, and trying to make it really practical for people. How do we cultivate more patience? How do we cultivate um, integrity or resolve uh, or rest or ease? How do we actually make these experiences real in our life so that we are more resourced and well-prepared to engage with the really overwhelming challenges that are unfolding around the planet? Thank you. I'm interested in the fact that much of your work seems to be focused on this intersection between what are timeless teachings and the moment um, we live in or the day-to-day -day actions we find ourselves in, such as communication or dealing with difficult times. And I know that you've spent uh, a significant period in monasteries. Um, I was wondering, uh, now that you've also been a lay Buddhist teacher and moved in those circles as well, speaking to this intersection, which I think represents a really fascinating uh, interplay, what do you feel is the most important lesson that the monastic communities um, and teachers could be sort of gleaning from, from many of the Dharma lay teachers? And what do you feel uh, is an important lesson that the sort of dharmic lay teachers might be uh, gaining from the monastic ethos? And granted, these are huge, broad brush strokes. You don't can't group everyone into categories. But I am curious that there are certain flavors or threads which are perhaps more pronounced in each realm. And I'm curious how you found those two merging or informing your own teaching and practice. I mean, it's a humbling question in a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Buddha talked about the fourfold Sangha, right? Um, and I really see um, the monastic and the lay communities supporting each other, you know, and I, I think that they're, they're set up to meet different needs. Um, you know, I have several friends, uh, my own generation, uh, who we used to hang out together here in the San Francisco area uh, as lay people who are, who are both uh, monastics in the Thai forest, the Ajahn Shah Western lineage. Um, and our lives are quite different. And I think that the, the forms of our practice reflect that and reflect different, different priorities and they're trying to meet different needs. Um, <clears throat> I think like one of the things that I received from my time at the monasteries, I spent about a year just as a lay guest at uh, Chithurst in England, and then two and a half years in white uh, as an Anagarika, both at Chithurst and at Tisarna, Ajahn Viridhamma's place um, in Ontario, um, is the, the value of, of form in practice. And I think this is one of the things that, in particular, the, the, in, the lay insight meditation world underemphasizes because of the cultural context in the West and the psychological tendency towards striving and overachieving and rigidity. There's this kind of movement to counter it with a lot of emphasis on gentleness, relaxation, uh, even a certain kind of formlessness. And I think that that is, is only useful to a certain point. And um, there's a lot of resistance in the lay community to working with a form, whether it's Anapanasati or you know, sort of techniques of meditation, like the body scan or mental noting, all these different meditation exercises we have. Um, or the, the rigorousness of following a schedule or having a set commitment. And, you know, as you know far better than I do, 
so much of monastic life is um, learning through the form, learning to discover uh, our strengths, the nature of freedom and letting go through pushing up against constraint and form. Um, so this is, I think, something that we in the lay community can really uh, take from and learn from the monastic uh, world. Other aspects of the, my time in the monasteries that um, hold a lot of value that I think the lay community doesn't always teach as well or embody are things like um, community and, pra and work as practice. It's kind of a huge emphasis in the, in the Ajahn Chah lineage in particular in the Thai Forest tradition. Um, you know, there's a, I guess it shows up in both communities, you know, the kind of bias that the, the real practice, right, is sitting silently in meditation or doing walking. Um, I think that overlooks the importance of integration and engaging with the whole of our humanity and really honoring the complexity of the psyche. Um, so this is another piece from the monastic uh, world that I, I see as having relevance and a contribution to the lay, the lay tradition. As far as the other way around, um, I think the most honest answer is I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not living in the monastic community and, and don't know what the specifics are of the challenges that you all face. Um, if there were anything like from the outside that I see, um, it would maybe be two things. You know, one, I, I think that the lay community, and these are generalizations, of course, every individual and monastery is, is unique and has its own strengths and limitations. Um, but in general, um, my time at the monasteries, there seemed to be, again, a, a bias towards solitude and formal meditation as the real thing and the most important thing and a, a devaluing of the relational space, a devaluing of emotions. Um, if there's interpersonal conflict or tension, it, it's kind of relegated as an, uh, in something that's interfering with practice rather than part of practice and something that's revealing something to us. And again, I'm generalizing, but that bias seems to be there. Whereas in the lay community, I, th I think in part, here in the West, because of the huge influence psychology has had on many of the teachers, there's much more of a sense of kind of turning towards and including that sort of interpersonal, emotional, and psychological material in the practice. And then um, there's this particular complexity, I think, around how the teachings get applied on a structural and a social level. And I know there's a lot of different views around the role of monastics in society, particularly when it comes to politics and social issues, right? Um, I've been very inspired, though, by um, the teachings of people like Thich Nhat Hanh or um, Joanna Macy or... Uh, even Bhikkhu Bodhi, who really make the argument that the framework of the Four Noble Truths needs to be applied on a collective level and that the suffering we experience in different communities um, and on, on larger levels also needs to be understood, transformed, released through Dharma practice, that it opens us to that to that realm and so this is an area that I I think is um, a real growing edge and a learning edge for monastics in our day and age and how do how do we make sense of and hold the tensions between honoring 
lineage, tradition, and the values that that upholds with the demands and the pressures uh, of change in society. And you know, I know issues around uh, bhikkhuni ordination have been huge uh, within this particular community. Um, and the, but that's just one example of you know issues around class, wealth, racism, oppression. So how do we understand? those through the lens of the Dharma and what is the place of those issues and those conversations within the monastic community. I know it's something that the lay community is kind of actively grappling and stumbling through and you know making lots of mistakes and doing our best with. Um, and so that's, that's a piece there I think where the, the two communities have something to share and to learn from each other. Yeah, how does that sit with you? That was an astoundingly good answer to a, quite a huge, hard question. So thank you so much for, for, for that. Ajahn Kovilo. Yeah, for me, it reminds me of this uh, Dhammapada quote, verse 302, that difficult is life of the monastic, and difficult it is to delight in that form, but also difficult and sorrowful is the household life. Uh, suffering comes from samsara, so therefore don't be an aimless wanderer in samsara pursuing suffering. Um, yeah, I felt you gave a really nuanced and great answer um, to that question, and it's always good for us to look at our, our blind spots, and uh, it's certainly the case, yeah, living in a monastery that um, <laughs> it's almost custom designed to be uh, siloed, you know, to be this kind of echo chamber, and um, hearing from people uh, outside of that, that chamber uh, is uh, very important, and I also just... Uh, to advocate for monasteries, which certainly you were you were doing as well. You know, it's it's nice also to have these bubbles of people who are somewhat outside of the culture to uh, give some kind of perspective to the the greater culture. This reminds me of a really interesting quote from your book. It was in the mindfulness section, um, and I just want to hear maybe how you um, thread some of these difficult um, needles. So the quote is. Popular mindfulness, uh, and I would suggest that it's not just popular mindfulness culture, but actually some of the oldest texts as well. So popular mindfulness suggests that the sole source of our suffering is individual and internal, ignoring the vast influence of structural factors such as racism, sexism, and poverty on our well-being and our ability to access inner resources. Um, so how does one balance that with, uh, say, quotes from the, the suttas, uh, which say something like, I am the owner of my kama, heir to my kama, born of my kama, whatever I do for good or for ill, of that I'll be the heir, really suggesting um, the primacy of that um, first person internal, uh, I'm the owner of my own karma and actions, versus seeing a broader perspective. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm, what a beautiful question. Thank you. Yeah, there's so much to learn. And, you know, I, I ap approach this question with a certain, um, a certain quality of, of humility and inquiry in myself. Uh, I think it's one of, those, one of those questions that, for me, is it's valuable to to stay curious about and, and to hold in my awareness um, rather than to try to come to a fixed idea about or have a view about and to recognize the, the complexity and mysteriousness of these different forces. What, what is a self? You know, who, who, am, who am I and how is that really complex experience of subjectivity that we each inhabit influenced by the larger forces and structures of our society and are those really separate how do, how can we separate them how do we separate them um, you know, the buddha talked about karma on a collective level right there's some acknowledgement that there can be I, I believe so. I can't point to the specific sutta reference, but 
I've, I've heard teachings about you know, some sense of collective karma, um, open to being wrong there, if that's uh, one of those things that gets misquoted. Um, So I, I think there's something to be said for you know, the handful of leaves, right? Like the Buddha's saying, this is what you need to know to free yourself. My understanding is the Buddha wasn't trying to solve oppression. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't trying to restructure ancient Indian society as an egalitarian liberal democracy. Like that wasn't his aim. You know, he was interested in helping people to understand their true nature and stop suffering in the way that, that we are able individually to do that. And so like, that's what the teachings are pointing towards as I, as I understand them. And so the, the teaching on karma in my that you that you quoted there it's pointing to what are the intentional actions of body speech and mind that i'm responsible for that shape my experience and that lead to more suffering or the ending of suffering from moment to moment my sense is that the more we understand that and the more we're able to transform those those patterns of greed hatred and delusion uh, of reactivity on an individual level the more we're able to be an agent for change and transformation in some of those larger structural or collective levels and that being said that the the, the process of unhooking and under un, understanding our own suffering includes looking at and examining how is how are the experiences I'm having conditioned by those larger social forces and how do I disentangle awareness from them what is what is that what is that process yeah there's probably more to be said there but just curious what your thoughts are on it or how does that how does that sit with you um. Now that sounds uh, just about right. And um, yeah, the phrasing that the Buddha wasn't trying to restructure ancient Indian society to be an egalitarian democracy sounds about right. <laughs> that is correct. But uh, I think, um, yeah, realizing what we can find in a handful and what other leaves we have around us which are still relevant for our lives is, is uh, navigation, which is essential. And one thing that comes up from that is this tension between the timeless and that internal working of mindfulness and then the external world, which in some ways um, perhaps was externally embodied in your time at the monastery and then your time, I mean, I know that you've, well, this is actually the essence of my question is with uh, so many practitioners in our community, they have tasted the Dhamma and really intuited its power and value and want desperately to bring their lives in alignment with it such that they feel whole. They feel like their external world is um, aligned with their deepest values as well. Like there's not this constant tension between this internal orientation towards practice and their job and parenting and relationship. And, and yet so many of them find that very hard to, to do, to keep, um, in your book, there's another quote, uh, no longer pulled in 1000 different directions. We are freed from the agitation endemic to modern life. Uh, and then this, uh, collected mind is rare and radical. It, uh, it relinquishes multitasking, increases our attention span, and heals our fragmentation and scattered concentration, reclaims our innate holiness, and magnifies the power of the heart-mind. 
and just in terms of uh, how to bring someone's life into alignment um, with the Dhamma, how have you managed to do that yourself? Um, you know, and obviously, you know, we speak about making relationship and parenting practice, but what kind of advice do you have for someone who just finds that they want desperately to do that and the burdens and anxieties and duties of modern life don't seem to totally allow that tension to dissipate? Yeah, how have I been able to do that? <laughs> it's a valid question. Um, yeah, the quote you're you're reading there is from the I think the chapter on concentration, right? And talking about the value of a collective mind, and how rare how rare it is. Um, I'm I'm brought back to the passage from the Dhammapada that you just read, Ajahn Kovalo. You know, difficult indeed is the householder life, and um, it's very real. It's very real. The um, the challenges and one it's one of the things that I valued so much about living in protected Dhamma environments, whether it's the monastery or living at a meditation center like the Insight Meditation Society, um, is having the structural supports of a schedule, a community, Buddha Roop is everywhere, you know, at the monastery, you know, bowing every time you walk into and out of a room and just these kind of reminders that stop us um, and bring us back to the path and the practice. And it's like almost everything in popular society is pointing in the other direction, right, which is why the Buddha characterized his teachings as going against the stream, against the, the currents of accumulation and craving and becoming. So I, I think the first, w where I'm getting to here is that I think the first step is to, re is to acknowledge um, the reality of the challenge and the... Um, the immensity of the task for lay people who are deeply committed to the path, that it's not easy and it is going against so much. Um, and for me, that just creates a lot more space and compassion and forgiveness um, for the difficulty rather than somehow making it about our shortcomings or you know, not being whatever enough not having enough motivation or a commitment or aspiration or faith or diligence, you know, fill in the blank of how you want to criticize yourself, but to be radically honest about the, um, the strength of the forces we're up against. Um, everything from, and you know, you kind of went through the list, but everything from the technology, media, and the sheer economic pressure of trying to keep a roof over your head and have food on the table and health insurance, particularly in a country like the United States where there's such a little social safety net. It's a very, very real um, pressures. And, and that experience of pressure, I think, lives in the nervous system. It's not... Um, it's not just like an idea. The, se the sense of not being at ease or being fragmented um, is like the air many of us breathe in the society. So you can't address an issue until you have some understanding and respect for it. It's like working with the hindrances it requires a, a lot of understanding, awareness, and respect for their strength. Yeah, so in the same way, understanding the strength of the forces we're up against, I think, is an important first step. And there are things we can do. It's not hopeless. <laughs> um, so some of the uh, key things that help me um, and that I would recommend to my, my fellow dhamma farers in the lay world, um, one is to, is to start small. 
you know, um, I always talk about whenever I lead retreats at the end of the retreat, I try to tell people, you know, be realistic. I would rather you sit for five minutes every day and do it than say, I'm going to sit for an hour and, you know, never get to it because who has an hour, <laughs> right? So to be really realistic and start small, I like to say that um, it's the um, consistency, continuity, and quality of our attention that matters rather than the quantity. So five minutes of a sincere practice to me every day um, will have an out, more of an impact and a transformative effect than one hour on Saturday. And the rest of the week you're just running around crazy. <laughs> um, so start small, um, which includes taking it one day at a time. <clears throat> you know, really just, like my wife asks me sometimes, you know, like, what's your day look like tomorrow? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to, like, focus on today, uh, which isn't always such a good thing. I, you know, I, sometimes I miss things in the morning because I don't know what's happening. So I've actually started looking at the calendar the night. I was like, okay, what's actually happening tomorrow? But I try to really stay focused on, like, okay, just what am I doing now? Because I can't do the other things. So why worry about them and just taking care of what's in front of me? So one day at a time, one moment at a time. Um, don't do it alone. This is really, really huge. Um, I think for all of us on the path, you know, I, I, I find the passages where the Buddha talks about the importance of Kalyanamita so moving. You know, um, the single most powerful external cause for the arising of right view as being wise companions, right? Like, wow, <laughs> that's really big. Who am I spending time with? So, um, and for many, I think, um, on this path, depending on where we live, it can be very challenging to find like-minded people and to develop meaningful relationships and friendships. So this is really important. Uh, and if there aren't people locally availing oneself of the tremendous resource of online community today, like places like this, these kind of broadcasts you all are doing, other communities that get together and practice online um, is essential. And then maybe the last, so, you know, start small, one day at a time. Don't do it alone. Um, and then the last thing is I, I think it's really important to be clear about what we're practicing. Um, the path is so broad in some sense. It's one of the things that I learned in my time at the monasteries is the diversity of practices that the Buddha offered and um, the kind of creativity we can have in training the heart. You know, everything from chanting to service to ritual um, to study. And so um, one of the things I find a lot in the lay, um, in the lay Dhamma scene is there's so many different tools that get thrown at people that there's kind of this like confusion, a little bit of muddiness about what we're doing. And so people kind of bounce around into a little bit of mindfulness of breathing and then do some metta and then I kind of open awareness and then I go back to metta. And that's just in the sitting practice. And then there's a sense of like, oh, I'm just mindful. I'm just being mindful. But like, what does that mean? And how am I actually practicing that? So one of the reasons I wrote my book was to try to provide a little bit more of a scaffolding for how do we actually make this stuff real and transform our lives and our communities from the inside out. And one of the ways of doing that, I think, is being really clear about, well, what am I practicing? What am I focusing on right now? You know, am I, am I cultivating patience? Is that the parami I'm working with? Am I, um, am I cultivating mindfulness? And then if so, what does that really mean to me and how am I practicing it during my day? Rather than just having some vague idea like, yeah, I'm just trying to be mindful all the time. Right? Like, well, when and how and where, you know, like, what are you being mindful of? Are you being mindful of your body? Are you being mindful of your emotions? Are you being mindful of your intentions? It's just like being mindful is just becomes this kind of vague general thing rather than a clear practice that we can follow. Um, so that's, that's another uh, way of kind of anchoring ourselves in our lives so we know what we're coming back to, what tools we're really practicing. 
that was a very rich response. Um, a lot there. Um, but I overarching principle of just being clear about what we're practicing. Yeah, of course, that's, that's really important. And I uh, appreciated your, um, your new book. This is uh, your heart was made for this. And each chapter, what it is, is basically a, a gradual cultivation of wholesome qualities. And you go through, I think it's 26 or so um, specific qualities. And it's great that you highlighted them and spoke about them um, so explicitly. And just in general, something you mentioned in your response and um, both in this recent book and in your response and uh, in your, your earlier book, Say What You Mean, bring it back to the body bring it back to the body it's so important and i appreciate that about your books and yeah when one looks at the suttas it's interesting um bante Nalio notes that when you go back to the suttas you find a number of different body discourses within the suttas and there is this strong encouragement to have mindfulness inside the body but another discourse is um, mindfulness of the unbeautiful aspects of the body and this is something which is so highlighted in monastic communities, you know, celibate communities where, um, you know, sexuality and sensuality is really um, at the forefront of our, of our practice. And I'm curious um, what, um, yeah, what is, what is the place for the practice of asuba in, in a lay practice? This asuba is literally um, focusing on contemplating that which is not, not beautiful about the body. Is there a place for it in lay practice? Um, and if so, um, how does one do that? Um, is it important for everyone? Is it, yeah, what's, what's the scope of that? Great question, yeah. Hmm. So I, I don't really know um, in, a, in a broad sense. Um, I think if I were further along on the path, I might have <laughs> a better sense. Um, I can, I can talk about how I've related to it, you know, and how I understand it, um, and the way I encourage the, the lay student practitioners that, that I work with and, and teach. Um, I remember, uh, talking with one of my first teachers, Manindraji, um, about the body and um, him saying he used this analogy that I'm curious it maybe maybe it's from the suttas I'm not sure he said you know trying to practice and make progress on the path while being attached to your body is like sitting in a rowboat and trying to row while it's still moored to the shore So I, I think there's something, you know, clearly the Buddha emphasized it for a reason. He wasn't, he, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't seem like he did things, you know, just on a whim. So if it's there and he's emphasizing it, clearly there's, a, there's an important purpose to it um, in our practice. And if we're, if we're aiming for, for liberation then it seems essential to understand what is the role of this, which is why I appreciate the question. At the same time, I think we have these different contexts, right? And living a celibate life is a very different context than being in um, a partnership where sexuality is, is part of that relationship. And not everyone who's a lay person is in partnership. Not everyone who's in partnership um, is engaging sexually, you know, depending on their values and their choices around that. So I think that the, the way the practice gets used will vary depending on our context and our goals. And I say that because, you know, when you're connecting with your partner, it's not the time to be practicing a supa. <laughs> If you're in a lay context, it's, you know, that, that will not serve the purpose of, the, of that of that uh, connection, that relationship. Um, but that doesn't mean I think we need to throw the practice out. So for me, I, I understand the practice in, in two ways. Um, 
two, two or three. One is to examine and transform our relationship with, with lust and perception. Right? It's looking at the perception of the beautiful, which is something the mind creates in, in the external world. And so it's a study, in, in per, to me, it's a study in perception. How does the mind create the object as something that's beautiful or undesirable or that's repugnant and undesirable? Right? And there's that beautiful sutta where the Buddha kind of talks about um, being able to see the beautiful and that which is unbeautiful and the unbeautiful and that which is beautiful is this incredible sort of flexibility of the mind when we've trained it to be able to use perception skillfully. So, and all of us can do that. And we can do it with a body. We can do it with, you know, an object like a phone or a computer or a piece of chocolate cake. And the way the mind constructs perception and then craving arises from the contact and the perception that's there. Um, so the Asuba practice to me is is first an invitation into understanding and, and witnessing the unfolding of that process in consciousness, which then gives us a way of working with and understanding lust, sensually, and more broadly speaking, kama tanha, sense, sense desire and craving. So I think that lay practitioners can work with asuba both directly you know, you're out on the street, you see another body that's attractive, and you study how the mind creates the attractiveness. You take it apart, you look at the unattractive parts, you take the body apart, and learn how to work with that function of perception and its relationship with lust. One can also use it, um, the, the practice I learned from, from Ajahn Sachito of the, the patikulas, right? How you, you turn the perception of something around. So you see something as new, attractive, and beautiful, and you look at the other side of it. You see, in two years, it's going to be all beat up and old, or it's going to be the older model, and do I really want it? So it's the, to me, it's the same principle of the Asuba practice, but just applied in a different way. Um, so this is, this is one way I think that, that lay practitioners can use um, the practice. An, another purpose of the practice as I've explored it and understood it, and it's not a practice that I've done deeply, um, but it's one that I have a little bit of familiar with, is familiarity with, is understanding, it's, it's a, a practice of, of insight into anatta, right, of understanding the constructed nature of the self through the lens of the body. The body is just this composition of parts, of all these different parts that are actually, you know, quite repulsive when you look at them individually from that perspective. Um, and so I think there's a very kind of deep invitation to those of us who have the aspiration of, of awakening, who are living a lay life, to, um, to examine our relationship with our body. And um, you know, to really investigate, you know, what, what is this body, whether it's just the, you know, head of the hair, hair of the body, uh, skin, teeth, nails, it's just a kind of deconstruction of the external part of the body, looking more deeply at, at the form. Um, and, and am I my body? The reflection on the sense of identification with the body. And I, I understand one of the ways the Asuba practice works is that through the cultivation of the perception of the unbeautifulness, that helps to break the attachment. Because why would I want to be this beautiful, this unbeautiful thing? It's like as I when I when I see the body as you know like this wonderful, attractive, vital thing, it's like I am this body. It's you know like ah, this is me. Versus it's like. My back hurts and my skin's kind of dry and my nails keep growing and I smell after a few days and I have to keep cutting my hair. It's like, ah, is this me? Right? So it's, I just find it incredibly fascinating. And um, yeah, it's just like this adventure into exploring human existence and consciousness and like, what, what am I? And it's this invitation to look at oneself in a different way. Um, and there's the, 
you know, my experience from the times when I was practicing a suba more, um, just practicing it more, um, it does reduce lust. And it does um, shift our orientation to physical intimacy. And so I think there's one of the things I, I talk about with a lot of the lay practitioners I work with is the deeper we go into the practice and the, the further along we travel on the path, the more our life changes. And, you know, certain activities fall away. And, you know, the, the first ones to go are usually the kind of more gross uh, violations of sila and things, you know, intoxicants causing harm and things like that. It's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. It just doesn't feel good. Um, friendships fall away that no longer align with our values. And so, you know, I think that there is that potential as we go deeper into the path and really look at the nature of the body and the nature of lust, that our relationship to sex and sexuality changes, not because there's a moral judgment that there's something wrong with pleasure or physical connection, um, but the internal experience and relationship of it starts to shift such that our priorities and our desires are different. And then that's, that's coming from a very different place than some sense of, of moral or ethical judgment, like there's something wrong with this or I shouldn't be doing it, which is I, I don't think the point and is not helpful. So it's a long-winded response, but... <laughs> Thank you. That was, no, I mean, we're coming at you with some difficult ones and that was a, a great answer. I, uh, I've been caught between two questions I want to ask, so let me put them both out and see which one you feel most interested in. Yeah. One is speaking of these teachings like body contemplation, which are core in a monastic environment, but perhaps more difficult to bring to a Western environment. I'm curious about how you've worked with and what place you see for the teachings on rebirth. And, um, and second, uh, I would love to hear any stories, inspiring ones you have about the teachers which you've had faith in, such as Manindraji or others. So uh, I don't know if either one of those sort of jumps out at you, but you could even do both if you really wanted. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think you probably have a sense just from our conversation. I, I, have, I take a very pragmatic approach to a lot of the teachings and just looking at like, well, what works, right? Like what, what's the purpose of this? And does it, does it free the heart from ignorance and attachment? And, you know, I think the teachings on rebirth, that's, that's kind of how I hold them in the sense that like, I don't know, I don't, I don't have, um, siddhis, I can't see past lives. So I don't have any, you know, knowledge to prove or disprove it. I take a sort of like, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> approach to it, but I look at, you know, what is the, um, what's the utility of it? How do we, how do we use it in our practice? And I, I find that um, the, the momentary interpretation of rebirth is often very helpful for people. You know, how many lives do we live in a day? <laughs> how many lifetimes do we live in one lifetime? Like, how many people have I been? How many, you know, even in, the, even in one moment of time, it's like, you know, my husband and my father and my son and my brother and my you know instructor and my facilitator and my citizen and my who you know all of these different lives and these different roles that we have um, so I think there are many ways to understand it and to the degree that it supports a sense of faith energy aspiration uh, taking that orientation or that cosmology of multiple lives great and to the degree that it confuses us or leads to um, doubt and vacillation, then I think it's helpful to just set it aside. Um, yeah. And, you know, in, in relation to the, the teachings on karma, I don't think one needs to believe in rebirth or further birth to see the law of karma in effect. 
very directly in our own lives. And for me, that's always been enough to um, validate the teachings and recognize that this is talking about a real phenomenon that I can experience and witness with, with my, own, my own mind and body. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words about Godwin Samaratne, who um, is less, less well known um, in some circles than Manindraji. The whole book about Manindraji, which is quite good, that Merkin Master wrote called Living This Life Fully, um, that I highly recommend for anyone who wants to learn more about him. But um, I only spent three weeks with Godwin, uh, the first, those first three weeks of the study abroad program I did when I was 19. And uh, I always had wanted to spend more time with him. And he died before, uh, before I could. Um, even though he was younger than Manindraji, he, he, uh, he died, got sick, and sort of very, very quickly uh, went downhill and passed away. Um, there was a, a gentleness and lightness about him that was kind of infectious. Um, this kind of child, almost childlike um, joy and curiosity about being human and being alive that um, one just could kind of be uplifted by just by listening to him talk and tell stories and joke and laugh. Um, he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, and uh, yeah, I just... I feel like there's this imprint uh, in my being um, from having spent time with him. And there, there's, there's um, audio recordings of his teachings kind of out there on the internet um, that I highly recommend for people who aren't familiar with his teaching. But, you know, it's, I, I think we learn from our teachers um, not just intellectually or practically, but that there's a transmission of um, their being and whatever you want to call it, maybe their state of awakening or their parami, um, that kind of, if we're open, um, it leaves us a uh, kind of indelible impression on our hearts and kind of remember and draw strength from uh, that felt memory. And so um, one of the things he always used to say that uh, stayed has stayed with me, a few things he would say, um, he said, learn to be your own best friend. And this was um, something that he really embodied and modeled in his lightness and sense of humor. Um, and he said, uh, sometimes when I don't feel so good, I like to say to myself in a very gentle way, it's okay to not be okay. And just, the, just the, the tenderness and the warmth and the lightness of that, that, that kind of unconditional embrace of oneself, just wherever you are, um, was a real gift that he gave me. Yeah, thank you, Oren. Um, yeah, I have not, uh, I've not met him myself, but I believe uh, that um, Bhikkhu Bodhi as well um, took him as one of his, um, yeah, at least influences and says he was basically living the bodhisattva ideal. So it yeah, sounds like a really beautiful person. Um, on this theme of finding inspiration in someone, having faith in a teacher, I was, uh, I was moved and impressed with your um, reframing or perhaps retranslation of um, sadha, as, which is tr traditionally translated as faith. You do use the word faith in the book, uh, but in the first part of your book, where you talk about the five powers, um, you frame that first factor as being aspiration. And uh, I'm curious if you could speak more uh, about yeah, how aspiration or faith um, work along the path. And I just want to read uh, a quick quote um, from that same section about doubt. So you say that uh, doubt, which is, can be seen as like the opposite of faith, doubt agitates us, squanders our energy, and can stop us from pursuing our aspirations. Spinning and waffling endlessly, it distorts our vision. In contrast, healthy skepticism examines data in a careful way without agitation, spin, or distortion. 
thereby bringing us into deeper relationship with reality. So beautiful quote. And um, I think a lot of Westerners, which uh, I feel like your book does a great job of speaking to people who uh, are perhaps wary of religion and religiosity. Um, and because of that, often are skeptical of faith. So yeah, could you, if you could speak a bit more to this, this play. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, Sadha is the leader, right? It's the, it's the first of the Indriyas. Um, I, I borrow that translation aspiration from Ajahn Suchito. I think it's one of the, one of the ways he translates, uh, Sadha is aspiration. And, um, I think Tan, uh, Tanisaru Bhikkhu often translates it as conviction, right? So what I love about the different translations is it, it starts to give me a sense of the richness and the nuance of one of these Pali words and kind of all of the different ways it can manifest and that we can understand it. So Sharon Salzberg, who translates it as faith and has a beautiful book uh, by the same title, Faith, um, talks, about, talks about it as... Um, trusting your own deepest experience. Um, and I love that because it's so accessible. It's like, what is it that we know to be true in the deepest way? So this is one, this is one aspect of it. I, I talk about this as the receptive aspect of sadha, of aspiration. It's that sense of allowing ourselves to be held, um, of, of allowing ourselves to trust, and uh, like what, where can we rest our heart? Um, and it's so essential, I think, um, just as humans and just the, the burden of suffering, you know, the dukkha, that which is heavy, it's, it's hard to be here. <laughs> it's hard to be here in so many ways. And, uh, that sense of being able to have refuge and this connection between um, between sadha and and refuge is so um, so intimate for me. That, you know, it's this place that we can feel like we can let down and feel protected and held and safe. So this is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, and the reason I chose aspiration as the translation and the title of that chapter, is a, is what I talk about as a more active aspect of it, which I connect with vision. Um, which is more that sense of conviction that Tan Jeff talks about of like, where are we aiming? What's our sense of um, what's possible? And I think the reason it's, my understanding of the reason it's there at the beginning of the Indriyas and why it's so fundamental is unless we have some sense of there being something possible for us, something better, something good, something fulfilling, we just sink. There's no energy. There's no motivation. There's no orientation. So there needs to be the, the um, some experience on some level, whether it's intellectually, emotionally, uh, physically, uh, in the heart, through intuition, some concept that there is a better, a brighter, a richer, uh, more meaningful, beautiful, fulfilling experience potential in life for us to to turn towards the path and make effort and this is why I, you know it's there at the very beginning of the book um, and why I see it as so fundamental and so important and and maybe this can kind of bring us back to one of the questions you asked earlier about the connection between individual suffering and, and karma um, and the structural forces in our society that um, create conditions of suffering for so many. Um, this, this factor of aspiration can function on a collective level too, and I think it's why it's so, um, so powerful and important to have a vision of what our communities or society can be like. And when we look at, when we look at history, you know, we see how the articulation of an aspiration can bring can be a force for change and good in the world. And some of the examples I use in the chapter of like the Declaration of Independence, 
you know, which has sparked revolutions around the world and which is still, you know, in spite of the complexity of the history and the founding fathers of this country is still held up as a document that articulates a vision for a society where all have dignity and equity and access to our rights as human beings. Um, or Dr. King's, you know, I have a dream speech, like why is it so powerful as he's articulating this vision of what's possible that then gives us something to orient towards and constellate around and move towards. This is very, so I think it's a very, it's very powerful um, energy um, and capacity in the, in the human psyche and makes sense that the, the Buddha would um, give it such a prominent place Thank you. I think we've kept you for quite a while, but I did want to just finish with one closing question based on that vision of aspiration. And that's if you had to articulate a prayer or an, an aspiration for this book going into the world, uh, what would it be? Hmm. Hmm. May it give uh, all of us the strength and the courage to act in ways that create a better future for, uh, for all life on the planet and uh, may it embolden and empower those who don't have a voice um, to rise up and be heard and, uh, and lead the way uh, towards a different future. Warren, thank you so much. Um, yeah, beautiful prayer. And uh, from what I've read of the book so far, it looks really wonderful. Um, myself and Ajahn Nisibo and our board up at Clear Mountain, we did a deep dive into Say What You Mean. Uh, I know there's friends at uh, monasteries, monastics, novices, and monks who are using your book as a, a textbook to learn how to speak more skillfully to others. I've got friends, you know, from before I became a monk who had nothing to do with Buddhism and have also picked up your teachings and your books and really found a lot of value in them. So you're a really uh, powerful voice. And uh, yeah, Jen Nisibel and I both really hope we can stay in touch and um, yeah, wish you the best. So thanks for speaking with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, I look forward to staying in touch.